Now, this is a deep cut. Our classic today is about a civil rights hero that has an entirely different story behind the scenes. Yeah, I kind of don't want to spoil any of it. Yeah, it's kind of better that you just uh, go in cold or, you know, knowing what you already know and um, let us sort of uh, add a little more depth to the story of Mr. Ernest Withers. In an interview with an amazing person, Mark Perisquia, that we spoke with about this, uh, it's worth your time. We hope you enjoy. From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Hello and welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined with our super producer, Casey Pegram, today. Most importantly, you are you. You are here and that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. We'd like to start today's episode with a quote. Men may be without restraints upon their liberty. They must pass to and fro at pleasure. But if their steps are tracked by spies and informers, their words noted down for crimination, their associates watched as conspirators, who shall say that they are free? And that's a quote from Thomas Erskine May from the work Constitutional History of England. And you may be wondering, friends and neighbors, why we're opening today's episode with this quotation. Today, you see, we're delving into a story of deception, of subterfuge, the struggle for equality, the ethical dilemmas of espionage, and the life of one Ernest Columbus Withers Sr. Withers was born on August 7th, 1922. Uh, He spent 60 years of his life working as a photojournalist documenting the African-American experience in the American South, with the most well-known work occurring during the Civil Rights Movement. And over the course of his career, he took some of the most iconic photographs in American history. These are completely fantastic, like time and place. They take you right to it. No one else took photographs quite like this. Um, He traveled with Dr. Martin Luther King uh, and other civil rights leaders. He was a trusted friend and associate, a member of the inner circle. He even sat in on strategy meetings. And after his death in 2007, his legacy lived on as newspapers across the country and the globe published his work. Today, he is remembered, as Noel said, as an iconic photographer, a loving family man, a hometown hero in Memphis, Tennessee, and in a very real way, the the eye of the civil rights movement. It turns out he was also working in secret for another organization. This is a story that remained buried and may well have been lost to history were it not for the efforts of a veteran Memphis journalist working at the Commercial Appeal. Through laborious research, Mark Perisquia bought this story from the murky world of domestic intelligence into the light of the public sphere. And here's the thing, folks. We always, as you know, want to go directly to the source whenever possible. And by golly, by gum, by gosh, today we succeeded. Uh, We'd like to welcome Mark Perisquia to the show. Thank you for coming, sir. Well, thank you for having me. We're really excited to talk to you about this, not only for the the work alone, but the work that you do in general. Uh, You're an investigative journalist, sir. Yeah, there's a few of us still left. <laughs> I can't. I mean, that that was the path that I personally wanted to take. But as I was getting through college, kind of made the realization that it probably won't happen for me. Well, you probably made a good, wise career choice there <laughs> because it seems like you got a good thing going on here. Uh, yeah. I, I, honestly, though, just uh, personally very excited to have you on the show well, and you. as we all are. Thank yes, you. here, here. And you, sir, have a quite amazing thing going in your new book, A Spy in Canaan, How the FBI Used a Famous Photographer to Infiltrate the Civil Rights Movement, a deep dive into the story we briefly just set up. Well, it all started back in 1997 when I was covering James Earl Ray's hearings at that time. Uh, James Earl Ray was the assassin of Martin Luther King Jr. He was in the last year of his life. He had liver disease and was trying to get out of prison. And he was floating all kinds of pleadings in the criminal court in Shelby County, Tennessee, um, conspiracy stories. His lawyer was coming up with these things and they actually got the King family here in Atlanta to endorse many of these stories. And Dexter King, Martin's younger son, 
actually came up and visited Ray in prison, shook his hand and said, you know, we believe you. We'll do everything in our power to get you out. I mean, it was just a very surreal moment. And um, the the news traction around this story was just huge, uh, became an international story. So I got a lot of latitude from the paper. Um, but at that time, I'd been there about eight years um, to really explore some of these conspiracy stories. And, um, you know, w- one of the things that I found is that, I mean, a lot of people think that, you know, the FBI, others had a hand in killing Dr. King, but that really wasn't the case. I mean, they were definitely trying to destroy him politically, but Ray shot him and um, – but it was in exploring these stories that I started interviewing former police officers in Memphis, former FBI men, military intelligence. And I ran into this agent in Memphis, former retired agent who told me, you know, give me the background about what was going on when Dr. King was in Memphis at that time. And, uh, you know, he said – I had asked him if they ever did electronic surveillance on King there. And he said, no, we, we had no need to do that. And uh, he said we had great informant coverage. And it was in this context that he mentioned that Ernest Withers had been an informant for the FBI, which, you know, when he told me that kind of blew me away in the beginning because, you know, wow, Withers, you know, he's so closely identified with the movement, you know, as you said, kind of the eye of the movement. And it was pretty startling. Um, the agent never wanted to go on the record. He said he'd deny it if I, if I – uh, if I ever wrote that. So I just kind of let it alone. You know, there's in, in the news business, there's a lot of things that wind up on the cutting room floor. I moved on when it, 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 it back into covering a lot of political corruption, which, which was rife in Memphis at that time. It was only years later after Ernest died that I filed a Freedom of Information Act request. And in the process of getting records back, I found that the FBI had left his code number ME338R, which is a unique identifier. In the in FBI jargon, they call it a source symbol number. But it said in a report, a background report on him from 1977, that he had been formally ident- uh, designated as ME338R. And so I was, like, it was a kind of a eureka moment, you know, yeah. like, you know, wow, this is true what this guy was telling me before. And so, but trying to figure out how, what do I do with that, you know, because it really didn't tell you much of anything. I got more records from the FBI that had been released from the from in the ni- late 1970s covering that 60s period in Memphis and I found that they made the same mistake over and over again. Um, again, you know, that with that source symbol number being a unique identifier, you could say – you substitute in Ernest Withers' name and say that he did X, Y, and Z for the FBI. So I did some initial stories and then I – met the daughter of the agent who had ran Withers, William H. Lawrence, and she – and he was he was dead by then. But uh, she had saved a number of his records that she found after her, – actually, her mother passed away af- after her father. And there were handwritten notes that he had that referred to Ernest by name and by code number. So I did more stories. And then the newspaper – this was a newspaper investigation. Um, we tried to get his FBI file and they just totally denied everything and said, you know, wouldn't cooperate. We sued him in court. They, you know, they fought us for quite a while. In the end, we wound up winning, uh, getting a mediated settlement and um, they had to pay all our legal fees. We'd spent like $200,000 pursuing this. Oh, wow. Yeah. They relied on a law that allows them to lie and they did. They, they lied about it. They um, – you know, uh, the law exempts – informant records from the Freedom of Information Act and they can pretend like certain records don't even exist. Yeah, that that would be exclusion 2C, is that correct? Yeah, right. Yeah, from – it was passed as part of the Anti-Drug Abuse Act in uh, 1986 under the Reagan administration. The whole idea was that was to try to to keep, you know, these corrupt – drug cartels from trying to root out informants in their ranks, you know, try by through a, doing a FOIA, Freedom of Information Act request and <laughs> discovering somebody. So the government said, you know, in that law that, that unless they first officially confirm somebody as an informant, they don't have to release anything. They don't have to admit anything. They can lie about it and that's what they did until it didn't work anymore. And then they had to admit in court that, hey, this is what we were doing. He was an informant and that led to this mediated settlement where we got all these records you know, that really spelled out what he did over the course of 18 years and is the foundation for the book. Was it almost like they were kind of abusing that We felt law? they did. Yeah. I mean, we, we felt that they, you know, this law was set up for a certain purpose to, you know, to keep these, you know, drug cartels where, you know, their, their whole business is murder and whatnot, you know, and, and that's what it was set up for. And we felt that they were hiding this whole, these political 
uh, informants from this 60s and 70s period where they had all these insidious political investigations going on. And what's fascinating about this book is that in this work, we're learning stories concurrently, both the legal fight that that you and your team at the paper uh, had to had to go into against the FBI as well as Ernest Withers as a human being. Well, Ernest um, Ernest was born and raised in Memphis, and he was um, he fought in World War II in the Pacific Theater, and actually that's where he learned to become a photographer. He he was he was trained with the Army Photography uh, School there, and uh, started shooting out in the Pacific, shooting pictures of. Uh, of uh, servicemen, you know, and they'd sell them, you know, for $2 a piece or trade a can of beer, you know, to get more film, to shoot more pictures. He really learned that that the trade there. And when he came back to Memphis, of course, he wants to start out in a business and he launches a small studio there um, and starts shooting pictures um, documenting life in the African-American community in Memphis. And he goes shoots the Negro Leagues baseball games, you know, the Memphis Red Sox, and he meets a lot of, you know, big stars, Satchel Paige, you know, and and, and Jackie Robinson, all these these guys who went on to become, you know, huge in, in America. He knew them you know, before nobody, nobody knew them. Well, and he couldn't get access to a lot of the white versions of what he was photographing at that time. In, in Absolutely Memphis, right? not, right. I mean, you know, it was segregated. Memphis was, you know, like the rest of the South was was segregated at that time. But, you know, Ernest was very enterprising. So he opens a studio on Beale Street. Uh, at the same time that he, you know, this was the late 40s, he also became one of the first African-American police officers for the city of Memphis. They had a lot of pre- police brutality in that town. And they still do to this day. But... That was kind of the the impetus for um, the the city decided we you know we need to ha- recruit some black officers because they would have better rapport with the, a lot of the citizens. And Ernest winds up becoming one of the you know in that first recruit class, nineteen forty eight. He's one of the, what they called the original nine. And so he's working all these jobs. He's working a beat a beat down on Beale Street as a as a cop. You know, and 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 at night he's down on Beale Street hustling photos. You know, taking pictures of BB King and Howling Wolf and others who you know again you know they they would become household names. But back then they were just guys on Beale Street playing you know playing down there. And he would sell pictures to uh, to tourists and fans and and whatnot. Um, he wound up that the the police thing didn't work out for him. I mean, he got hooked up in uh, the city's, you know, corruption, There's a lot of corruption in the police department. He was, he was working with a bootlegger selling, selling whiskey. It was petty, petty corruption. Wound up losing his job, but I mean, that really was the best thing that, that ever happened to him because, you know, that 1951, um, he starts going to work for, uh, as a freelancer for the Tri-State Defender, which was the satellite operation for the Chicago Defender. And after a few years, all things start happening. I mean, the, the civil rights movement starts blossoming. You know, Emmett Till is killed down in Mississippi. And he goes down and covers that. And uh, you know, then there's the Montgomery bus boycott. He's covering that too. So his career, you know, just really mirrored the, what was going on at that time. It was perfect timing, and he always had that that perfect timing, um, the, the access and everything. <laughs> As we're tracing the evolution of his of his career or his multiple careers, we do see that corruption is a larger theme or overarching. Right. And when when we're looking at the beginning of his involvement with the FBI, it seems that it may have started around 1958 or so. Is that correct? It did. Yeah. I mean, the first records in his file that show him cooperating with the FBI were from 1958. It's very sketchy about that three-year period about what he was doing at that time. Um, But the very first incident that we know of that he acted in an informant role is in Little Rock, Arkansas during the aftermath of the school crisis there. He comes into the field office with Simeon Booker. This is very interesting because these were still the movement's early days. Simeon Booker is a huge journalist. He worked for Jet Magazine. You know, he just recently passed away. But, but uh, Ernest, through you know, working with the Defender and, and Jet Magazine, got to know Simeon and really tra- trailed him you know, throughout the South. And the two of them come into the field office there and they're, they're informing on James Foreman, you know, another a movement icon. You know. And back at that time, James Foreman – was just a school teacher who, in the time part time that he had, would come down and start showing up at all these civil rights skirmishes. And of course, the FBI, which is picking up this, and he's showing up on their radar, is you know the, views him very dimly. He's 
associated with people with you know communist credentials. He's viewed as a suspected communist. They're very suspicious. Um, so Simeon Booker and Withers are there kicking back information about you know their dim view of James Foreman and. Uh, but you know, Booker had his own controversy as an informer. I mean, he was never paid, um, but he had a relationship with the FBI, um, and he explained that when he was interviewed by the Washington Post late in his life, and said that that you know, back in those days, you know, when I went down south, I wanted to come back alive, and he very much feared the local yokels down there. You know, the police departments—they were racist. You know, but the FBI had a little bit different. Um, <clears throat> reputation. I mean, this was the before all this stuff came out about Hoover and his, how he tried to destroy King and really, you know, tried to tried to um, infiltrate the movement as he did. And so, you know, Booker looked at the FBI as, as a friend, as an ally, and he did some puff pieces for them, you know, and they they helped him out at times. Um, there's no evidence that I know of that he ever named names like some, like you know, Ernest eventually got into, but. Um, it really seems, you know, the best the best information is that that relationship was initially cultivated somehow through Simeon Booker. Ernest gets this idea that these are good guys. Sketchy from what he was doing in 58 to 61, but in 1961, the whole landscape down there changes in Memphis. You have the um, – what they call the tent city operations where in the metro area, their rural Fayette County, all these sharecroppers were – trying to register to vote and they were being kicked off their land for doing that. And so they 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 get they start living in these encampments, kind of like an Oki encampment where they're living in tents and all that. And all these relief agencies from the north start coming in to assist them. The Congress on Racial Equality was one of them. Again, the FBI is saying, wait a minute, you know, they're looking at these guys, outside agitators, people with leftist cr credentials, communists. They want to know who these guys are. They want to monitor them. And so and Ernest is out there shooting pictures. So Bill Lawrence, the FBI agent who ran the domestic intelligence operations in Memphis for the better part of a quarter century, they start crossing paths and they start a relationship and, and hit it off pretty famously. They, they, they had a lot in common. I mean, Lawrence was, you know, religious. He was, he was raised Baptist. Withers was raised Baptist. Um, they both liked music. Lawrence, Bill Lawrence had a huge jazz collection of, you know, records. And so he, he would use that as a, as a tool in his trade to, you know, build rapport with people. He recruited a, a, uh, member of the NCAA leadership in Memphis because of that relationship. They both had big jazz collections. They'd swap records back and forth. So he was a, Lawrence was a guy who could, who could really, he had a big personality, affable guy, very much like Withers, you know, uh, he he knew how to work it, and and these guys hit it off, and so they're they're starting to send Ernest out to the tent city operations at the same time. Nineteen sixty one, Freedom Riders are starting to come home. They're coming back from Jackson and whatnot, and some of these guys don't fit the 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 old school mold. I mean, they're they're more militant. I mean, they're not militant in the, the think of the sense of the late sixties, you know, Black Power and that. But but these guys are more into direct action, kind of, you know, we're not going to wait. We're not going to let you resolve this through the slow wheels of justice in court. We want it now kind of thing. And they were very, the FBI very suspicious of that sort of thing. But Ernest, because he'd been a beat cop for all those years, a studio photographer, a freelance newsman, he knew all these people. And he could, he, that's a great thing that he could do. He could, he could tell them who they were. He knew their relatives. He could tell the home addresses as they were building these dossiers. You know, he could get an identification picture because he was a photographer. He, he was very valuable to them. And, you know, at the same time, 1961, the Nation of Islam starts appearing in rural the rural south and really makes its first appearance in Memphis. They open a, a mosque on Beale Street and, you know, the FBI, of course, their antenna is up on them too. Very suspicious. And again, Ernest, he knows them all. He actually, you know, goes into their operations and takes, you know, what are posed portraits um, and, the, you know, gives them to the FBI. The FBI – cuts up all the portraits and they start building these dossiers where they're, they're cutting the, the individual individual images into face shots that are, you know, then, you know, they're building all these dossiers. So he was immensely helpful to him and, uh, you know, Lawrence knew he had a good thing from the very get-go. You mentioned um, one of the first pieces of evidence that you came across was this code 
number that mm-hmm. he had. And I believe you said initially it was 338R. Right. Uh, but then he kind of got upgraded, right? Or not maybe not upgraded, well, but uh, a different um, type of informant. R being he was meant to be like a racial informant. So he, yeah, the, the, R, the R was for a designated a racial informant. And there's kind of a lot of, you know, arcane history and all that. But initially when Lawrence got a hold of him, he wanted to make him a confidential informant. Um, his earnest history has with the Memphis Police Department came back to haunt him at that point because, um, you know, anybody who becomes a paid informant for the FBI it has to be approved by Washington. And so the Memphis field office is trying to get approval there. And Lawrence senses some hesitancy. You know, he goes to interview the, the police chief uh, of the Memphis police and, he had, and uh, J.C. McDonald. He had a very dim view of Withers, gave him a really bad recommendation. So Lawrence kind of hedges it and he says, you know, we're not going to make him – a confidential informant at this time, but he has so much information in, in what they call racial matters in the racial field that he made him a, a potential confidential informant, was a kind of a probationary status, that they kept him in for two years, which is a long time to be a, you know, a PCI, um, and would, you know, it was kind of a, a dubious situation because, you know, they would, they, they would direct him going out into the field, but a couple of years later, you know, the movement in Memphis is really slow then through the, the mid to late 60s. And so they downgraded Ernest at that time to a confidential source, which is kind of like a reference desk kind of guy. Like the, uh, I was just kidding. So not the same deal as police officers getting street informants, a much more significant vetting process and you have to meet a certain criteria. Right. They didn't want the control from – the FBI, the bureau would be looking over their shoulder and he wanted to be able to use Withers, you know, have some freedom to use him. And so when he he for f- about four years they made him a confidential source, which is sort of a lesser uh, informant, but he was doing kind of the, really the same same thing for them for four years. It was kind of like you know the answer man in the in the black community for them. And then finally, he didn't get the code number ME three thirty eight R until nineteen sixty seven, and by then, <clears throat> you know, you had the unrest is really blossoming through the country. You know, you had the riots and. Watts and then and then Newark and Detroit and the government is really uh, really paranoid at that point and they they started something called the Ghetto Informant Program and they swung Ernest into that gave him the code number um, he worked under that code number for about four years and then they tweaked it um, in 1971 he became ME 338E for extremist informant and a lot of his investigations at that point were focused pretty much on black power but you know. And it, what they considered extremists, although, you know, what they considered extremists, you know, we would just probably look as somebody who's just an activist who's, you know, trying to trying to stand up for civil rights. And one important point to establish about Lawrence's background here, uh, which, which you provide in, in the context of the relationship with Withers, is that Lawrence is – in his later 40s, right, when this right, begins, right. and he's already made his name oh, yes. busting communist threats specifically. Absolutely. right. And it seems that one of his primary motivating factors is the fear on the part of the Bureau that these groups that feel disenfranchised or left out would swing to the communist side. Is absolutely, that- absolutely. And that was the thing is that um, the FBI, you know, Bill Lawrence was very much a cold warrior. I mean, his his career, he cut his teeth right after he got in the bureau, right after World War II. You know, um, in the late forties, you know, when 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 the when the Chinese and the Soviets get the atomic bomb, like forty nine and that. This is when he's really going at it in internal security. And in the early fifties, they they just eviscerate the Communist Party in Memphis. James Eastland, the, the, the well-known segregationist um, senator from Mississippi, had hearings in Memphis and, and his work product was largely Bill Lawrence's investigations. And they, they you know, ran all these communists out of town, people who were involved in the labor movement there. Um, Lawrence arrests Junius Scales, who you know is was a, a Communist Party leader down there. It was a very famous case. He's He's seen, viewed today as the only man to go to prison for being – simply for being a member of a, the Communist Party or, or a political party. I mean they prosecuted him under the Smith Act. Uh, but there was all this paranoia and in Memphis as in a lot of places, places across the country, you know, the FBI went hard after the FBI and they basically wiped them out. And so you know, by the time the 60s come around and there's you – know, the, the movement, the civil rights movement starts blossoming, they're, they're very much worried about – communist influences, you know, and a lot of this stuff is like red baiting, you know, this 
really a version of racism, you know, that, you know, you guys are troublemakers, agitators. A lot of this trickled down from the top from Hoover, you know, that anybody who was involved in that sort of thing what had to be some kind of communist. And so they went after these, the, the, these uh, outside agitators, these groups very zealously. They wanted, they wanted to contain them. They wanted to, you know, keep them, uh, keep them from influencing the movement there. And the interesting thing too, the NAACP in Memphis, although they did a lot of good work, you know, on behalf of civil rights, on the whole, they were a pretty conservative organization. They they wanted to move slowly and cautiously. They believed in litigating in court to get your rights versus, you know, kind of the Martin Luther King thing of direct action, getting in the street, the sit-ins and whatnot and, and protesting. And so – and he had, you know, developed good sources within the NAACP leadership. He had at least three key figures there who were informants who were kicking back information to him and they – you know, he would influence them and they would, in, you know – try to go along with a lot of things that, that you know, that he and the larger society were saying. They didn't go for a lot of this stuff and they because they didn't – it was a lot of it was pre preserving the status quo. They wanted – they thought they were protecting the country's internal stability by keeping law and order, keeping things peaceful. You get your rights, but you can get them later, but you're going you're gonna to have to slow walk this. <laughs> wow. And then the question becomes – what next? Were they successful? How far did this conflict go in Memphis, Tennessee and later the United States? We'll find out after a word from our sponsors. And we're back to to focus on the scene as as it's playing out. So Withers is working with Lawrence and Lawrence's primary concern is ultimately the rise of communism. Did did Withers share this concern? Was he ideologically motivated to function as an informant? I think he was ideologically motivated. Certainly, when it came to the war, I mean, him being a, a World War II veteran, it, by the time the sixties, you know, mid sixties, he's got he's heavily invested in the military. He's got three kids in the military. He's got one in the front lines in Vietnam. So certainly when it came to, um, you know, the war, I think he was heavily invested in, invested in that, that, that ideology. Um, I think a lot of his motivation came from the need for money. I mean, he had eight kids. He was always hustling up a living. He could never really make it out of the, the kind of the middle, lower middle class li life that he had. So that was a big f factor for him as well. And ideologically too, again – he was a Memphis man and the influence of the NAACP was great. They didn't go for a lot of this confrontational stuff, you know, the agitators. That, the, those are the folks that were really viewed suspiciously. You do mention the financial motivation, which I think Noel, Matt, and I collectively found very interesting. As, as you established earlier, many of the informants were unpaid, right? Right, right. And Withers himself is an exception to this rule and you are actually able to discover the total amount of money that he received as compensation. Is that correct? That's right. Well, the reason we did that is because I made sure that when we settled with the FBI, they stipulated how much he got paid because the thing was is that when we did this deal, they said they wanted to save face. They did not want to have to reach into an informant file and bring out informant records that would say, sh show things like how much he got paid, how he's recruited, you know, how he was directed and whatnot. And all the other informants are going to want to get paid the same. Right? Uh, well, yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, there's, I guess, there's, uh, you know, a negotiation thing <laughs> issue there, but, um, but yeah, I'm um, so we stipulated in there that that they would tell us the, the amount, and what it was was twenty thousand dollars. Over those 18 years. Now, that doesn't sound like a whole lot of money. But when you think about it, you got to think about inflation. You know, that money today would be about one hundred and forty dollars or $150,000. So if he's getting paid that kind of money over 18 years, that's about maybe six dollars to $8,000 a year. I mean, that would get you – that would put food on the table. you got eight kids to feed. You get gas for your vehicles. It'd help you pay a mortgage. I mean, it's nothing to sneeze at. So, you know, the financial thing, I think, weighs into this heavily – more so than the ideological part. And as a matter of fact, my initial source told me, point blank, in his view, he said Ernest was in it for the money. But I mean, you know, given the situation with his career as a police officer, he obviously didn't have scruples about, you know, doing things under the table or, or doing things that weren't necessarily 
legal. Right. Well, I mean, the thing, too, is that, you know, I try not to judge Ernest. I mean, he was a man of his times. That police department was very corrupt. And there were a lot of guys who were doing the same sorts of thing. And there's a strong argument to be made that they rooted him out because he was black. I think racism does play a role into it, although I don't think it excuses him in that regard. But yeah, I mean, there's a, there was a lot of corruption in Memphis, still is. And the extent of his work with Lawrence and the FBI was not the kind of James Bond stuff we would imagine with a secret agent. It was, as as we said, it was almost entirely surveillance and reporting. Is that correct? Right. Well, I mean, a lot of people think, you know, when somebody's an informant, they think, you know, some somebody covertly working undercover, playing a role, infiltrating a criminal organization, which is kind of the classic, you know, informant that you'd have. Um, these operations didn't work like that. I mean, he was an intelligence informant. And what they were trying to do, I mean, the FBI, they weren't trying to prosecute most of these people because they couldn't. They'd had their wings clipped in so many rulings that, you know, a lot of these operations were actually technically illegal, you know, especially when you get into the COINTELPRO stuff. They never had authorization from Congress or law, you know, any law or anything. They just did it. But, you know, what these intelligence informants would do. They were trying to collect wide swaths of personal and, and political information that the FBI could use to monitor people, to help contain them, and sometimes to act against them. And so that's what he was doing. He had no need to be, you know, cloak and dagger, undercover. All he had, all Ernest had to do was be earnest to get the information they needed because every, he had incredible access. He'd show up with his cameras. Everybody let him in, whether it was meetings, marches. You he was know. beloved, right? And he, was, he still is beloved. And, you know, and if I haven't said this yet, I should. I mean, he is a legitimate civil rights hero. I, I've said this many times. I don't think anything he did for the FBI eclipses the good that he did for the movement. His pictures are just overwhelming and very powerful. And they were powerful in their time and they are now. But I do think this hidden history rivals what he was doing. I mean, it's it's a history that's very instructive for you know us. If you know if we want to live in a true democracy, um, you know a lot of stuff that they were doing, building files on people. It was it, it really was crazy stuff. I mean, it was you know a lot, a lot of it was illegal. Yeah, it, it's fascinating to imagine him inside Martin Luther King's hotel room. There's a picture of MLK sitting on the bed holding up newspaper, and you just imagine Ernest being in there and just that close with him at, at all times, right. I mean, as, as much as possible. He, he was he was very trusted. Um, you know, I do think that the connection between Ernest and, and Martin Luther King has been hyped a bit. Yeah. You know, King was, you know, based in Atlanta, and Withers was in, in Memphis. King didn't come to Memphis a whole lot. I mean, and, and, and Withers was an informant for Bill Lawrence in the Memphis field office. So even though, you know, he would go out to these various civil rights events that would take him down into Alabama and uh, Mississippi, Arkansas, you know, kind of a lot of places. But the, the, the bulk of his, his operations was right there in Memphis. And so there wasn't a whole lot of opportunity. King came to Memphis, you know, in the late 50s. He came there in 1966 for the March Against Fear. And then he came there three times in the spring of 1968. So, you know, even that said, I mean, yeah, I mean, King's staff loved Ernest. Every time they came there, they you know he and Ernest had that big personality. I mean, he would joke, and they they really liked him, trusted him. You know, in these pictures that you're talking about, you know, you know who could have got pictures like that? Exactly. You know, you know, Dr. King, you know, just relaxing totally on his bed and not seemingly not a care in the world. You know, it's they really are amazing pictures. Now, Withers had over the course of his work with the FBI several. We call them close calls, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and one of the questions that we had was uh, a what-if scenario. What would have happened had he been caught or exposed? Because uh, in the book, there are several instances where someone hears him talking on the phone to someone. Yes. Or where uh, activists who have been questioned or targeted by the FBI come to him and say, What's going on? Mm -hmm. So, what what would have happened had the uh, had he reached that jig is up situation? <laughs> well, if it had happened, I think in 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 the the heat of 1968 during the volatile sanitation strike, I think that he quite possibly could have his reputation could have been severely damaged, and I think he would have been viewed quite possibly as a traitor at that point. Um, you know, there were a number of people who were who were working with the Memphis Police Department, which worked in close, very closely with the FBI there in a lot of these investigations. And they were 
found out. And, you know, there's a, a report of one instance where an officer who's there undercover is literally dragged up onto the stage in front of all these people. They strip him of his gun and his mace can and they basically were going to, you know, rough him up. And it was only because some women came and intervened that that they let him go. And, um, you know, one of, one of the big uh, pastors there, H. Ralph Jackson, who became a movement leader during the sanitation strike, you know, at one point during the, the strike, <clears throat> there were so many so much pressure to you know for the, from the police to provide information. He's there at the pulpit, and you know Ernest is in the crowd, and he's telling him, "If there are any police snitchers here, he says, I won't stop you from being being beaten up." You know they're just tired of all this. You know, so I think that Ernest things could have been much different for him had this come out at that time. It's interesting he did have a number of close calls. I do think some people did find out in various ways they knew this and that and whatnot. Um, you know he was called to testify before Congress in secret in 1978 when they're reinvestigating Martin Luther King's murder. And um, that was another close call. That was probably the biggest, closest call of all. And they, when you read these reports, the public reports, they never refer to Ernest by name, but they do say that they asked him if he would be willing to go public and he didn't want to do it. And it, interesting too, um, that was around November of 1978. In January of 1979, Ernest is indicted in Memphis as part of this clemency for cash scandal. I mean, he's into this huge corruption scandal up to his eyeballs, where where the you know the very corrupt regime, the the Ray Blanton administration, they're letting inmates out of prison for cash. You know, murderers, robbers. You pay ten, twenty thousand, as much as eighty thousand dollars, and you're out on the street. It was it was you know he's indicted in in all of that. His defense attorney, I interviewed him. Um, he didn't know that Ernest was an informant. And he told me, you know, wow, I could have really used that. I think I could have – even though Ernest got a great deal there, he wound up – he turned state's evidence and wound up testifying in two trials. And they gave him uh, one year for extortion with six months suspended. Um, he got a hell of a deal. But he could have got – I don't know if I can say that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah please. <laughs> he, he got a hell of a deal. and But he could have gotten off maybe completely. But, you know, why didn't he tell his own defense attorney? That's an interesting question. I think – he was still, you know, the, the 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 heat of that, you know, so close to that being called to Congress to Washington in nineteen uh, November nineteen seventy eight. This is just months later. I think it, it just unnerved him to the point where he didn't feel he could say anything. Yeah, and in your book, you say that his last report to the FBI had only occurred a few years prior to that. Yeah, I think it was 74, 75. I mean, he's still pretty close to right. the people that he's just been informing on. And right. at this point, he's informing on the Black Panthers, right. on a lot of some of the more militant groups. Well, yeah, do you think he was in danger of bodily harm? I mean, quite, being... quite possibly. Although, you know, I think Hoover and the FBI really hyped that you know, the, the threat of black power and, and in Memphis too because, I mean, they did have a, a small contingent of Black Panthers there. But um, they, they were no threat to anybody's public safety. What they were doing was uh, they were um, – they tried to start a breakfast program for poor children and they were trying to put awareness on sickle cell anemia. Um, at one point in the early 70s, by one of the FBI reports, there are like – seven people in this Black Panther wow. yeah, unit. And and one of them's Ernest. <laughs> they they list the names and one of them's Ernest and the other is an undercover cop for for the Memphis Police Department. So um and you know it's interesting too there. Okay, they were they weren't they their reputation was much more threatening than what they actually were. But they took this thing very seriously. And, the, and it's interesting too that that Ernest um at one point takes pictures at the instruction of the FBI of the outside of their Headquarters, their home. It's a two-frame house. This one picture shot way across and kind of through branches, and it's kind of you know sec secretive and mysterious looking. And then he gets a picture of the front door and goes around and gets a picture of the back door. And, you know, it's quite clearly they're trying to identify the points of ingress and egress out of this place in the contingency that they might have to raid this place. And they also get information from Ernest about what weapons are inside. And so what he tells him is there's a 22 pistol next to the bed and there's a shotgun, you know, kind of just the kind of the weapons that an average Memphian or, you know, Southerner mm -hmm. would have, you know, like. But like who's sleeping in which rooms, which room <laughs> has the gun? Like it's exactly a, what you would need to enter that home. Absolutely. And it's interesting too, you know, that could have been a, a huge fiasco because if you know the story of Fred Hampton. Yes. 
member of the Black Panther Party in Chicago who a lot of people believe it was a police murder of him. You know, they, they had a bureau informant sketch out the layout of that apartment and the police come in in the middle of the night and shoot like you know, scores of rounds through there and kill him. I mean, I mean, who knows? Maybe something like that could have happened here, but it's kind of a very similar situation. Yeah, so let's, let's look at some of the – aftermath with with this with this report uh, when you when you release the initial story when the story first breaks how did people react both in the Memphis community where withers is uh, I believe as you established he has streets named after him he's got a blue note he's, he's got he's got a blues note on Beale Street which is the the equivalent of the Hollywood star he's got a building named after him this is 2010 he's got a street named after him. Since then, he's got a museum and his, he's got a historical marker outside his home. Yeah, and w- what was the, the reaction both in today's activist community uh, with Withers' surviving relatives and with Memphis at large? Well, I mean, there was a lot of disbelief. Um, Ernest's family and circle of followers, initially it was said that, you know, I made this up. Um, that position has morphed over time as more information has come out. At one time, it was said that, you know, the FBI might have called him an informant, but all he did was sell pictures to the FBI, just like he did to a lot of clients. Which is not in it, in and of itself illegal. No, it's not. And, and it is something that he did. The thing is, is that he did a lot more than just that. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was giving a lot of oral intel and really infiltrating a lot of these groups. But, um, yeah, I mean, there was a whole spectrum of reaction. Dick Gregory, the famous comedian, activist, you know, labeled Ernest Judas. That's what he called him. He said he betrayed the movement. Um, that was a rather harsh critique. Um, Judge DeArmy Bailey, another longtime civil rights activist who's also passed on, did feel that Ernest betrayed the movement. But then you had people like Andrew Young who, you know, said that, you know, look, we were a transparent movement. You know, he really couldn't hurt us in any way. Mm-hmm. I don't see what the harm is of that. I don't think Dr. King – would have, you know, found any anything wrong with that. But you can't deny that he ruined some people's lives well, that's with the, the information thing. that he gave. That, that's the thing is that the individual abuses – and that's why, you know, when Congress – you know, when the church committee in the 1970s looked at a lot of these operations, I mean, they found just – rife with abuse. I mean, the the thing is, is that they were collecting data on people who were, weren't doing anything illegal. They were they were standing up, you know, marching in the street, exercising First Amendment rights, standing up against the Vietnam War, you know, standing up against Jim Crow. And but they were treated as enemies and all this personal data. You know, one of the things that Ernest did is he'd give them auto tag numbers. Um, he'd give them uh, phone numbers and the FBI would use those to do warrantless searches of Target's, uh, you know, phone records. They'd go through, they'd have a source at the phone department and they'd go and, um, <clears throat> you know, get them, find out who their toll charges are, who they're talking to because they want to figure out who their associates were and on and on. And but, but there were a number of incidents like that that when the, the FBI very strongly in, in Memphis in the late 60s tried to undercut the black power movement and it's very similar in the way they went about it to the whole McCarthyism era of the 50s in that, they went after sympathizers, supporters, associates, in addition to the actual activists. And so, and again, people got hurt in that. There was, there was, there's a man who actually is going to be speaking with me tonight, um, Bobby Doctor, who was a longtime activist in the, in the movement, who by the late 60s was working for the U.S. Civil Rights Commission as a field representative in Memphis. He went on to become the Southeast Regional Director here in Atlanta where he worked for the organization for more than 40 years. But early on, he nearly lost his job because of these FBI investigations and Withers played a role in that. I mean, he was deemed as somebody, he, you know, Withers and other informers kicked back to information that, hey, look, this guy, he's he's at some black power oriented meetings. He's he's at social gatherings with these, with these activists. And at one point, Ernest even passed on a picture he tells his handler, Bill Lawrence, you know, I was covering this march and Bobby Doctor was there and he was holding hands with this woman, you know, and Bobby's married and the woman's married, but they ain't married to each other. And so, and Lawrence, oh, I got to have the picture. He got the picture. And, you know, of course, he puts it all in the report. And so, you know, they're, they're trying to undercut him. He, he had a colleague there, Rosetta Miller, same kind of thing. Withers gives him pictures, passes on rumors about her and, you know, tells him that she's the kind who will give – Aid and comfort is how Lawrence paraphrases Withers will give aid and comfort to the black power groups. So that's the thing about this that I think <clears throat> Andrew Young, you know, bless his heart, 
didn't consider when he thinks, you know, that these were so innocent and what what would it matter to a transparent movement? It matters because they were going after certain individuals and they were trying to hurt them. Mark, it's one of our great regrets that we don't have more time (laughs) today for this interview. Uh, But we do want to close on a note that we know our listeners are going to be asking. Uh, You mentioned the surveillance techniques of the of the 60s and into the 70s in the book uh, how would you say government surveillance is different or similar today because as many of our listeners know COINTELPRO is over yeah it ended right? for sure yep well you know the hearings out of the 70s they you know they talked about a lot of reform and the FBI you know when the, all this stuff came out reeled in these investigations they had like something like at one point, you know, 50,000 different domestic intelligence operations going on of American citizens and, you know, in the mid to early 70s and by 77, they're down to virtually zero. So they really tried to reform the program, um, you know, in the years that have passed since, um, you know, the, the, they tried to focus more on, on actual crimes, terrorism, whatnot. You know, you, have, you get information, you do a preliminary investigation and then if that, you know, if there's more probable cause, you launch a more a full – field investigation. You know, there are a lot of people to this day who who believe, you know, like I think you mentioned, who don't really believe that they were also, in, you know, reformed. In Memphis recently, there was a lawsuit filed um, on behalf of, of various Black Lives Matter activists. They are getting um, indications that this same sort of thing is going on today. And it's interesting in Memphis because, you know, the Bill Lawrence helped set up the Memphis Police Department's Red Squad there, the uh, domestic intelligence unit. They worked very closely together. And in the mid-70s, the the, uh, the ACLU filed a suit. They found out that they were gathering all this political intelligence and got a landmark decision, a consent decree that forever you know, forbids the Memphis Police Department c- from conducting illegal political surveillance. Some people think it's still going on. And it's kind of interesting that I wrote a story about, you know, Shortly after I did the, the first Ernest Withers stories about that consent degree, and I asked the police department for their, their uh, manuals and uh, their, their procedure manual, and in it there was no mention of this consent decree, and so and they didn't even know what I was talking about. They very quickly amended that and put it in there. You know, it's just wow. But you know, w- there's a lot of people who think this this sort of thing is going on today, and this is what this suit in Memphis last year was filed about. There were several individuals uh, <clears throat> who were put on a blacklist where they said like – and several of them were Black Lives Matter activists and, and others who were politically active in their, in town there. And um, you know, the, the, the list said if these individuals show up at City Hall, they're going to need an escort. Well, how do you know who these guys are unless mm. you've done some surveillance their addresses and whatnot and you know, what, what they've been doing? This is the kind of thing that people think you – know, there, there's these secret operations to some degree – are still going on. Um, it sure feels like full circle to me in terms of the political climate that we're in right now compared to, you know, the period described in your book. Well, you know, it, it the, the 60s was a period of high paranoia and, and, and polarization. And I mean, yeah, I mean, we have a lot of that here today too. And, it, you know, it's been said that it was so easy for um, – certain informants, perhaps Ernest too, you know, to do what they did, for the government to do, to go after these individuals so strongly because there was very much this we versus they, they, they mentality, you know, that they're the bad guys, they're evil, you know, they're, they're communist controlled, which is a big thing you see in a lot of these FBI reports, particularly when it comes to the war. So, yeah, I mean, I think periods like this, you know, they're, they're ripe for abuse and, and this is why I think there's this need to be ever vigilant on these matters. Well, guys, I, I'm afraid we're not going to be able to hit everything in this book. But the good thing is, all you have to do is pick it up. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, we recommend doing so. Honestly, um, the three of us have read A Spy in Canaan by Mark Perisquia, and honestly would highly recommend it because the events in the book actually paint such a vivid story of surveillance by the FBI on people who are just trying to express themselves with our constitutional rights. I think it's a, an incredibly timely book, you know, with what's going on right now. I think it's a really fascinating read and can't recommend it highly enough. Yes, friends and neighbors, the book is A Spy in Canaan. Mark, thank you again so very much for coming on our show. And uh, we hope, if possible, uh, we could interview you in the future as things develop. I'd love to do it. 
That's all for us today. And that's the end of this classic episode. If you have any thoughts or questions about this episode, you can get into contact with us in a number of different ways. One of the best is to give us a call. Our number is 1-833-STDWYTK. If you don't want to do that, you can send us a good old-fashioned email. We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.